So, good afternoon to everybody. Thanks for coming. My name is David Ingles. I'm with Bloomberg Television. I'll be your moderator for uh, today's session. I guess let's first start. Uh, let me first introduce uh, our panelists for today. Uh, Mr. Budi Gunadi Sadikin, CEO uh, of Bank Mandiri in Indonesia. Mr. Jose Isidro Lito Camacho, Vice Chairman for Asia Pacific Credit Suisse. Mr. Chani In, President and CEO of Akleda Bank Cambodia. Ms. Chetna Sinha, Social Entrepreneur, Founder, Man Deshi Bank and President on Manvika's Samajik Sansha India. And right beside me, um, excuse me, right beside me, Mr. Jasper Bindra, of course, Group Executive Director and CEO, Standard Chartered Asia. And Mr. Matthew Driver, President, Southeast Asia MasterCard. Thank you for joining us. Now, maybe just to go through how things will flow, we'll be having a discussion here uh, up front. And a bit later on, perhaps towards the end, I will be opening up the floor to questions just in case, of course, you may have some lingering thoughts uh, on what's going on right now. Now, our topic for today is financial inclusion, or I guess in layman's terms, how do we reach out to the unbanked of Asia? How do we include them in a circle? I mean, certainly it does it's very apt that we're talking about this right now, given that we're in the Philippines, we're in Southeast Asia. You do have rapid growth, but at the same time, of course, alleviating poverty and reaching out to the poor will certainly be very important if all of these economies will, I guess, be able to sustain any sort of sustainable economic momentum and development going ahead. So in short, the key question we try to answer is what changes to financial products, have we seen how do we use technology to reach the unbanked in this region? So I guess to start off, Ms. Sinha, let me start with you, I guess for our audience and for the panelists as well. Can you give us an idea? Who is the client? Who are we trying to help here? So Mandeshi Bank actually started with a little bit of challenge because most of our women were non-literate and the banking license was rejected because how can a central bank issue a license to uh, prom who's promoting members are totally non-literate, so they are non-literate. But the interesting part was that women told officers that tell us to calculate the interest of any principal amount. If we fail, don't issue the license. But tell your officers to do it without calculator. And that's how the debate started. And 14 years back, we got the license. So these are the clients. But the interesting part is that these women, though non-literate, very smart in business, and most of them are street vendors, are sheep and goat rarers, dairy who are in dairy. And for such clients, what products do we have? There was no precedent. And in fact, I remember that when we started a banking with these women, I was actually fired by them because we had a very fancy uh, product for women, saving product, having a boxes with a photo of Mickey Mouse and, they, and we were waiting that women will come because of that attraction. And women said that whose crazy idea is this? We are not going to come to the bank. We don't have time to come there. So the first lesson was to have these clients was that if they are not coming, bank will go to them. That was first. Second thing. How, what product? Because we felt that maybe that these women require loans, so we start with loans. But they said, we want to save. And interesting is that we are not going, you come to our doorstep, we want to do savings, and we want to do daily savings. So we had to design a product in such a way that doorstep banking, daily savings, and if they are taking loans, women said that we want to repay daily. So it was a challenging that how do you design? And at the same time, I, after the first firing, I didn't have an, uh, I couldn't dare to explain them and think of educating them because they were so clear. And they did not require a financial literacy education because they said doorstep banking, daily savings, daily repayment. How do you do that? And with that challenge, actually in 2001, we were the first bank to design this electronic passbook for these women, which does not only just give a saving opportunity, saving, repaying, and also pensions. 
So it's very interesting. I I'm just like, would like to end that these clients, they don't have time. They, do, they want a simple solutions. And how do you do that? So try to bring everything together, make their life easy, listen to them. And they come out with a very different solutions, which you just have to cope up. And so we had a smart cut for these women who are, and, and I'm really surprised that when we started this product within eight days, 7,000 women, and they pay 50 rupees for these cards. So it's not that everything they require or they are asking for free, no. But the one thing is very clear that you should, banks should try to ease their problem and provide an opportunity of saving, pension, insurance, credit, and they are ready to do banking if it comes to their doorstep with their terms. So these, that's how the Mandeshi Bank operates, and I'm proud to tell you that today around 210,000 such women are banking with Mandeshi in two states of India, Maharashtra and Karnataka. Yeah, because I, before I guess I move on, I would also want to ask, so just we better understand that the persons or the people we're trying to help, do they actually have money to save? Don't they live day to day? See, this is a very interesting question. We generally think that uh, poor people do not have a surplus, and so they do not save. But I would like to say that there is no relation of surplus and saving. Everybody wants to save. Why they want to save? They want their children to go to school and they want to spend. They want to repair their house. And so they want to plan. In fact, Mandeshi Bank started with this, that one woman came forward and she said that not a single bank is opening my saving account. I want to save. And our question was simple. She's not asking loan. She's not asking grant. And she's not asking subsidy. And I, I also had the same question. I told her that how can you save and why do you want to save? Do you have a money to save? She said that before monsoon, I want to repair my house and I have to save. I won't be able to save. I will save every day so that I can make that much amount. I can save that much amount and repair my house. So it's very clear that poor people want, they, they are the first who would like, want to plan their lives. And for them, saving is, I think, not only equally important, but much more important. And they do save. Now, Jasper, I guess before, and Chetna, you, you touched on this, before we actually go into the topic of financial inclusion, you always talk about the importance, first and foremost, of financial literacy and education. Maybe you can expound on that. Yeah, clearly, you know, the starting hypothesis is that half the world's adult population is unbanked. So it's a very large number, three billion of people who are unbanked. And um, on the one hand, uh, there are lots of conduits in terms of uh, mobile uh, technology-enabled uh, channels to be able to reach these unbanked people. Uh, but the starting point is that to cover the last mile, there needs to be an awareness and education and understanding um, at the receiving level of uh, how to be comfortable doing it. And I think uh, the whole challenge uh, of uh, making uh, that segment aware, uh, the unbanked segment aware of the benefits of financial saving, uh, exactly as was said uh, by uh, Gita, that uh, there is uh, a huge latent requirement. But how does it sort of become um, known to them? How do they become aware? And the second point is that they are very intimidated they're intimidated by the institution. They're intimidated by the documentation. Uh, they are intimidated by technology. Uh, so this whole thing about providing convenience at the doorstep uh, is a big, big uh, part of the whole uh, move. So I would say that uh, financial literacy has to be a very big uh, part of the process uh, to make uh, financial inclusion possible. Whose responsibility is that? Is that the responsibility of the bank? Is it the government? Is it, does it fall in, in the arms of NGOs? I think uh, if we all believe that uh, financial inclusion um, has its benefits, which I believe it does, uh, because uh, if you bring 3 billion people or whatever fraction of 3 billion people into the system and you give them financial independence, you not only create a good thing for them, but you create a new market. You create a new opportunity for uh, whether it's for an FMCG company or it's for the payments 
company or it's for a mobile telco as it is for commercial banks. So clearly it is in everyone's interest who stands to gain. I think the government stands to gain the most uh, because what we take for granted is that cash is a no-cost option, whereas any other form of payment, uh, technology-enabled, um, is uh, expensive. But actually, cash is a very expensive proposition. It's fully subsidized by the government. So the government has the most to save by moving away from cash into either a card payment or a mobile payment or uh, whatever electronic uh, system of payment. Uh, nobody has ever estimated, uh, but I can tell you because in Hong Kong we print the currency, we store the currency, we know as a bank that it is a very expensive proposition to be printing currency and to be having to store it, secure it, transport it. It is a big thing, but it's a big thing even for the FMCG companies when they collect at their sales counters cash. It's a big thing for the merchant. So cash management has its cost. And uh, rather than sort of um, subsidizing the electronic or the technology-enabled payments, we actually charge more for the technology-enabled <laughs> payments. So we are creating a disincentive rather than creating an incentive. And I think that's a gap uh, that the government and all the other beneficiaries have to uh, take into account. Yeah, thank you. I, I guess we'll, we'll go back to the topic of technology and expound on that a bit later on how we actually deliver this in low, low cost, protecting profits and also making things affordable. Uh, Matthew, e MasterCard has a few initiatives in terms of uh, financial education, financial literacy. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it's in Myanmar, uh, a partnership in Myanmar. Can you expound on that? And sure. what has that achieved? Well, I, I think the, just the point on, on the back of uh, Just Bile's point, you know, cash is a four-letter word. And I think that the challenge is how do we um, get past that? And I think the, the work that we've done in Myanmar, we're working in the Delta region there with Mercy Corps, is about working with the villages, um, engaging at the community level to ensure that we're making them aware of the benefits of inventory management, planning for a rainy day, which obviously comes with a monsoon season, ensuring that they have the, the basic tools to understand the benefits of money management. And they're targeting essentially farmers and rural female entrepreneurs who are running a, a small store within the village. And what we're looking to do now is take that and essentially expand it and work with mobile operators to distribute that training. So we're trying to leverage the, the experience we have on the ground, and now use the new technology to distribute that training onto the mobile device. But you must first own a mobile device, I would imagine. Sure, for, for now, that to be Myanmar, it's, it's, it's early stage, um, but across the rest of Southeast Asia, um, virtually every adult, right. not quite, has a, has a mobile phone, but the, the bank penetration is significantly lower. So mobile really is the key way to go, whether or not that's virtually via an a e-money solution or whether it's a companion prepaid card associated with that account that really empowers that individual to use the payment network. Uh, Chani, if I can bring you into the conversation here, because your firm, Akleda, that, that's a very good model to copy across the region. Maybe you could perhaps tell us uh, about how you started, how you first obtained uh, a special and then a full banking license. Okay, so th thank you, David. So, uh, bank. In fact, uh, the full name of my uh, my bank start uh, Association of Cambodian Local Economic Development Agencies. That's a long name. So we call uh, Cambodian call A C D A and foreigner call Aklida. We start as an NGO for small and micro enterprise development, and then in 1998 it became a break even. That's the time when we work on the transformation from. NGO microfinance to to bank. So we start with the paid up capital of four million US dollars in in 2000. So obtain license as a specialized bank. As a specialized bank, we can only do one. Like uh, it, it can uh, provide loan or can provide payment services or can uh, collect domestic deposit. No? So this un under the regulation then. And and in 2003, it is three years later after we became a specialized bank with a paid up capital of four millions. So we triple our paid up capital to 13 million so that we can become commercial bank. We want to provide all range of financial products and services to all segments of the community because as a specialized bank, there's a limited services. And then 
2003, we become uh, we obtain license as a commercial bank, like uh, the other bank. But we have done more than the traditional bank because we services low segment, which is micro, small, and medium enterprise. And currently, uh, the bank have. I think have uh, coverage uh, nationwide, you know, but 251 branch and offices across the country. And then we, we uh, expand to Laos in 2008 as a commercial bank. We expand to Myanmar, obtain license as a microfinance in 2013, last year. So we are now in three countries, Cambodia, Myanmar, and Laos. So I see that it's possible because of the flexibility of the regulation. Without the regulation alone, we cannot, we cannot do like that. We cannot, there will be the boundary between the NGO and licensed microfinance institution because uh, in, in Cambodia, they, uh, they uh, conduct the reform on banking law and finance institution in, two, in 1999, which allow NGO transform from NGO to licensed microfinance institution. So one is the, we, we call conducive law and regulation, but, but allow such a transformation. Yeah. And then secondly, the, the, the size of the paid up capital. No? So when the Central Bank, National Bank of Cambodia allow, they set the, uh, like the paid up capital, just 70,000 US dollar for microfinance to establish a licensed microfinance institution. It means they encourage more. Because uh, you know those institutions were an NGO before, so it no tax. They pay no tax. They they provide loan with uh, subsidize some subsidize some at commercial, but no tax. So but when the regulation uh, develop, they allow transformation. So not just uh, from NGO to licensed microfinance institution, but. Uh, Company, you know, private individual can also establish a licensed microfinance institution too. You no, know, bring them to the legal system framework. They pay tax, they charge at commercial rate, they open more access. You no, know? I mean, because if we, they were remain as an NGO, they rely on the donor fund. You know? They they cannot implement their business plan properly. Then when they obtain license as a microfinance, they can. Uh, can access to commercial funds to finance their loan growth. So my bank, again, we don't start as a microfinance, we start as a bank. Like I said, in 2000, obtain license as a specialized bank. Small paid up capital, four million, and then we see that a great opportunity, you know, two things. On one, on one hand, we can uh, cont uh, continue to uh, service, I mean, a low segment. At the same time, we, we continue to serve them, we grow, with, uh, we grow together. Uh, and then we also make profit. We can be profitable. We can achieve a social objective and commercial objective at the same time. Uh, by, uh, by the end of uh, April last month, our paid up capital is uh, uh, 225 million US dollars and total asset around 2.6 billion US dollars. So again, I think the role of the regulation is very important. Open access to finance. Inclusive finance can, can achieve without we cannot achieve without the flexibility of the regulation. I don't want to talk about flexibility in by uh, violate the international rule and regulation as in, in line with the interna international regulation. Secondly, on the, the product diversific di diversification, no? product is very important. If as a bank, no, when the customer come to us, we said, oh, no, we cannot provide small loan. I think this is, we, we close the access to finance for them already. But if there's, we say that any, kind, any types of loan, any size of loan, you can have access. And then form of documentation, no, like it simplified based on, I mean, based on the nature of the people in the countryside which they don't have uh, their document properly, but we can live with that. So the role of product uh, diversification, and then certainly the network. I, 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 I heard that some of our, our friends just talk about the, the, the electronic infrastructure. I think electronic infrastructure and physical infrastructure play a very important role for opening access to finance. So if uh, uh, the customer can, ha if, uh, they can have access to finance during the office hours or during the, the office closure or on the public holiday, I think electronic is, uh, is uh, one of the better means for them uh, via ATM machine, via point of sale, and also telephone, telephone bank. We have uh, established the telef uh, telephone bank called ACDI Unity, which open access 
uh, for customer across the across the country. I think those are the three main things that uh, we uh, ex like uh, we exercise experience so far. So the regulation, which we talk to the central bank, and secondly the product diversification. We listen to the customer and we we add one product after another. I forget to mention when we start, we only provide micro business loan and small business loan. Right. But little by little, we add because the customer explain to us the customer need that the customer. Uh, request to us and then we develop according to their need no? and then the branch and offices and the electronic infrastructure so that they can have access on the 24 hours basis. Okay, now it, it's a very different story for Credit Suisse, Lito. Uh, it didn't start as an NGO, I would yes. imagine, Credit Suisse. <laughs> but you're also playing, you also have very big initiatives in this space. Can you tell us about that? Yes, uh, thank you, David. Um, as you mentioned, you know, Credit Suisse is a global financial institution, so it's much difficult, more difficult for us to, to go to the ground and, and do microfinance lending as such. Uh, so what we do is uh, we focus on what you know, uh, we can do using the resources and competences that we have in the bank. Um, first, let me just say that uh, microfinance is one of, the, one of three pillars in our CSR globally. Um, and within that, we really focus on capacity building. Uh, this is where we can use our competences. We work with partner institutions, people like uh, Finca, Akshon, uh, the, women's, uh, the World Women's Banking, uh, and, and so on, providing you know, grants, providing technical advice. Um, we do other related activities, um, for example, using our product skills. We look at innovations, how to scale up the capacity of microfinance institutions. Might be a listing of a successful microfinance uh, company that I think we've done in Mexico and, and India. Uh, it might be uh, setting up a, uh, an impact investment fund that would provide equity capital to small enterprises that would otherwise not be available to them. Uh, it might involve refinancing of portfolios of uh, microfinance institutions so that again they can scale up and do, and do a lot more. Um, we also try to encourage our employees, particularly our young employees, uh, to volunteer and get involved. And uh, we do have a program that uh, allows us, using our partner institutions, to deploy young bankers globally. Uh, it might be an investment banker in London, you know, flying to India and spending six months working with a microfinance institution and helping them on risk management and IT and other uh, functions you know, where his or her technical skills uh, can be deployed. Um, we, um, th we also have a Credit Suisse Research Institute. Uh, and through that institute, you know, we do research and we do publications around microfinance, you know, like impact investing. Again, a way to promote and propagate you know, the concept. Um, we also, in fact, are a partner of the World Economic Forum. Uh, there is an initiative within WEF on financial inclusion. So we, uh, we are members of the steering committee with one of my colleagues and even at the working level. So our focus in Credit Suisse is really how we can, we are very committed to the sector, uh, but we are not able to work at the lowest level. So we try to capacity build and empower, enable, expand the ability of successful microfinance institutions to do more and to do better. Now, perhaps a bank that's near the ground, uh, Budi, if I can also bring you into the conversation, because your bank actually operates in a country with 17,000 islands, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, that's a key challenge to reach the unbanked. Yes, uh, financial inclusion is topic for the poor, about the poor. So looking at the number of audience in this room, <laughs> I realized that this region has become extremely rich. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, uh, I, I used to work for a bank, uh, Dutch bank. Uh, the Dutch entered Indonesia 350 years ago, and since they came, until now we only have 50 million Indonesians have an account, have a bank account. And we are already GDP ranked number 15 in the world. So you can imagine if we can increase that from 50 million to 100 million, the money enter the banking system can be used to lend, increase the velocity of money, GDP of country will increase drastically. Maybe we'll join the G20 uh, member. Or if we can increase from 50 million to 200 million, 
then maybe the next Indonesian president will not be invited to attend the G20 meetings, but instead he will be invited to attend G8 countries meetings because our GDP will grow faster. Now the problem is if it took us 350 years to penetrate 50 million Indonesians, based on simple calculation, we might need 1,400 years you know, to penetrate 250 million Indonesians to have a bank account. For your information, a lot of Indonesians now have a much better access to cigarettes rather than to open the bank accounts. <laughs> our smoking inclusion is much higher, much better than our <laughs> financial inclusion. So uh, then, 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 then the issue is how, how we can accelerate the penetrations of financial inclusion. I have a, my colleague, a CEO of Indonesian telecommunication company, I talked to him. When did the telecommunication industry enter Indonesia? He said when the Dutch came 350 years ago, and we only have 30 million house phone and office phone. But he mentioned in 1994, they introduced a new technology called mobile phone. And in 20 years, 220 million Indonesians have access to telecommunication inclusion, providing basic telecommunication services such as talking and texting. And that is without zero government subsidy. So in 20 years, the telecommunication industry successfully penetrated more than 220 million Indonesians for telecommunication inclusion, basic telecommunication services, zero government subsidy. Financial inclusion, our government has subsidized trillions and trillions and trillions and only 50 million. Yet you already number, uh, rank number 15. So now the challenge for, for Indonesia is how can we accelerate piggybacking on the success of the other industry to increase the penetration faster and cheaper. You mentioned cost. Does it, and anyone can, can please, if I could get your opinion. So does penetration also mean, do we still stick with that model of putting up branches where the clients are? Because typically, as you mentioned, Jasper, they're intimidated by all these documents. People are used to walking into a brick and mortar perhaps if that's the first step that they have to do before we actually get them bank accounts and then we can work with mobile phones. Do we still need the branches where they are? We invited, we invited Michael Joseph, the head of M-Pesa three times in Indonesia. And I asked uh, Michael Joseph, Michael Joseph, how many branches do you need to penetrate M-Pesa in Kenya? He said 20,000. Michael Joseph, you came to Indonesia three times. What is your guest estimate? He estimated 200,000 Moody. And then I do my checking. I talk to my uh, Unilever, Coca-Cola, Procter & Gamble, because those products have access to 200 million Indonesians. How many outlets, shops do you have? And their answer will be the same, around 300,000 to 400,000. Cigarettes company, mobile operator company that have access successfully to 220 million Indonesians, they need 200,000, 300,000 outlets. Until now, all banking system in Indonesia, you add all of those branches, only 20,000. So that is exactly what we need. But we can't build 200,000 branches because 350 years, we only be able to build 20. So then we have to do something, the branches banking model, the agent banking model, to make sure that we can accelerate you know, the penetrations of the branches. This is something that I've been lobbying to the central bank governor to give us some leniency in, in, in terms of, 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 of licensing. Opening branches. You know what? Actually, I feel that uh, there is a problem of financial inclusion on supply side. How? Uh, government policymakers and mainstream banking sector, particularly which are government owned, they look financial inclusion as opening the accounts. And then they keep complaining that these accounts are not active, it's a zero balance. And then it has a, such a poor vision zero balance account. I mean, I was when this whole concept comes with financial inclusion and zero balance account, which means that you are going to the clients who are not going to do banking. But if you see, if you talk to a rural woman or who are unbanked who want to do banking, they want to create a wealth by being a part of the bank. It's not just inclusion, it's a creating the wealth. And how do they create? as you mentioned in Cambodia, that you have a diversification of product. So you provide a loan for goods, for buffaloes, sometimes for education of the children. This is the wealth they create by banking. So I think the whole idea is also inclusion, but also the main issue is that how do you create? Why cell phone 
In India, more than 80% of the household all over India have cell phone. Why? It's because it's helping them in so many different ways. They don't have to travel so much. So same if we think banking in that way, then the one thing is that branchless banking, doorstep banking, banking with not much hassle, as you mentioned, that you know, if you require a, to open account, KYC norms, so many papers, no, it is not possible. How do you make it very simple, very easy? With one ID, it is possible. And uh, so I feel that there is a need not only just to change the talk about inclusion, but also need to think as a wealth creation for a poor people, because they are thinking that way. And I just would like to end with that, that just if, if there is any uh, proper research done, what are the people doing with the money which they get from the bank? And I'm sure, I mean, we did an impact assessment of our client, and it wasn't, it was spent so wisely. I mean, why I say that? Because we did the research with the household, and we saw when men, they save, they would say that we want to buy three wheelers, that two wheelers, that's why we save. Women, they would say that I, I save because I want to buy a buffalo, or I want, it's something to do with, you know, which will give her a multiple income. And I come last, which is like most wisest thing I have seen, is that you talk to young girls also are savings. And I was thinking maybe the young girls are saving for marriage, but no. They said we are saving for our higher education. So you see this rural population, see the aspiration, they want to, save, go to the bank for the higher education also. So I think the whole mentality needs to be changed. And with technology, everything can be possible. I mean, Mandeshi has a Deshi Girls Bank within the, and with, by designing this product for young girls, I'm very proud to say that within three months, we had 12,000 young girls saving for higher education and see the, uh, investment in this human capital, what results we, are, we can have, I mean, what wealth we are creating. So I just, I mean, ending that we have to change the mentality. And I guess let's, let's also revisit this uh, before we move on. What is, what's the most popular product? Because people think about microfinancing as credit. Is, is, is that what people need or do they need savings first? Uh, for, for me, financial inclusion means financial transactions, financial saving, financial credit, and financial insurance. And that has to come that particular order. So people need to be able to do transactions before they can save. Then people need to be able to save before they borrow. So our whole initiative is started with transactions first, and then saving, and then credit and insurance. A lot of government make a mistake. They think that if we give you a credit, then every, everything will be solved. We have seen that. Trillions and trillions of US dollars has been spent. It is, it is more of popularity contest rather than you know, a real financial inclusion initiatives. Dito, you want to say something? Yes, I, I, obviously I'm not gonna be talking about Credit Suisse, yes. uh, but I, I just want to share a personal experience of having heard the presentation and, and then actually seeing the institution and you know, in Pabudi's country, this is uh, BTPN. I don't know how many people have heard of BTPN, but it, in my mind, is one of the most successful commercial models of what financial inclusion is all about. Because their business is all about lending to the poor and borrowing from the rich. Uh, and it's very, very simple. And, and I think it's because of the point that you made about cost, right? I mean, to be sustainable uh, and to be scalable, it has to be cost effective. And that's exactly what they've done. They only have two customers. They only have micro entrepreneurs and pensioners. And I had the opportunity to visit some of their branches in Indonesia. I was floored. I had to rethink my ideas of what a bank looks like, because they don't look like banks. They look like, more like community centers, unintimidating, you know, where a poor person, a market vendor, would not be intimidated to enter a bank door, you know, where you've got marble floors, you know, marble tiled counters, uniform guards, and uniform count, uh, tellers. You know, this looks like a community center, which is very welcoming. Uh, and and it's, it's very simple. They really looked at how to simplify the process of lending uh, so it can be done as cheaply as possible. It, I, I thought of it as the, you know, the fast food of banking. Um, I was so inspired that I, I actually thought that, geez, I could do this in the Philippines. 
And with permission from Credit Suisse, I'm actually working on a project in the Philippines, working with a couple of banks to see if we can replicate, perhaps not as big a model as BTPN, but at least as, success, as successful as they are. I mean, just to give you an idea of how commercially successful it is, it's a business that five or six years ago, a uh, private equity fund, TPG, invested $400 million to buy the pension bank. Uh, today's market cap is $4 billion. And they're helping the poor. They're helping millions and millions of the poor. They have about 1,000 branches in Jakarta. They're all located around market, public markets. Uh, I visited one of their pension business branches. Uh, you see old people. They have a medical center. Uh, they have community activities around pension payment dates. Uh, it, it's just mind-boggling. You re just have to re throw away all of your banking concepts uh, and, and think of how you can concentrate on what the targeted clients really need and what would make them comfortable to deal and be included in the financial world. Yeah. Inspiring. Matthew, I'd like to bring you in as well because MasterCard, you have you're trying to put into place very innovative payment solutions. We talk about transactions. Sure. These people transact multiple times a day. Yeah. In, in, in your experience and from what you're doing, can you tell us a little bit more about how, I guess, we're trying to drive uh, innovation in, in this space? Yeah, I think that the points have been made about you've got to change the business model that exists today. I think you have to reinvent and you have to look at the, the the situation that's relevant to that consumer group. So when we talk about, it um, doesn't matter if we're talking about training or inclusion, you're celebrating when you're repaying a loan, right? Typically at the bank, you're not really celebrating when they pay you off the, the money, right? So I think that how are you creating the right incentives that come with the structure? Also, just innovating with electronic payments is going to be critical. But I do think it's a combination of all those things. It's the point that's been made about regulation, about branch banking, about having you know, a reasonably coordinated agent banking regulation that enables the banks to reach out um, in, a, in a way that's lower cost. It's about integrating um, technology to ensure that you're lowering the delivery or the manufacturing cost of that product. It's about engaging at the community level. Our success in South Africa is all about your really engaging at the ultimate village or community level whereby that gives you the ability to expose those clients to the technology and the card and they can feel it and they can understand it. And I think all those things are, are really critical and then you have to educate and work with them and to, to, to celebrate their success and engage with the communities you're working in. So it's a multi-dimensional uh, solution if you like. And, and Jaspal, is from I guess the perspective of a bank and the implications of how you operate. Uh, is, is there a trade-off between reaching the poor and uh, microfinance, for example, and, and profitability? Uh, I mean, certainly we do have to rethink certain different types of models of trying to reach these people. And now we have the technology to do it. Mm. Uh, do you have to make certain types of investments to put that infrastructure in place to make it profitable and sustainable? I think the issue is uh, really, we have to answer two questions. Is there sufficient capacity uh, to be able to uh, make financial inclusion possible? Um, and secondly, is there sufficient willingness uh, by the players uh, to be able to extend? Um, I think we, ca we can never answer the capacity question till we have addressed the willingness. And uh, with all respect to everybody on the dais, I have to say there is a lot of room in terms of willingness uh, because uh, we have this very popular notion that when we talk about financial inclusion, we're talking about the poorest person 17,000 islands away. There is a lot of unbanked population in urban cities, mm -hmm. in Manila, in Jakarta, in Hong Kong, in Singapore, in London, in Bombay, everywhere there is a lot of, and I'm talking millions of people, I'm not talking 10, 20, 30,000 people here. Uh, there are millions of people who are unbacked. We just don't have, as an institution, uh, sufficient incentive. And uh, I think it's a combination of incentive from a profitability point, as you point, but it's also from a regulatory point. Mm -hmm. I think uh, as capital is going to continue to be raised uh, uh, 
you know, you're going, your appetite is going to reduce to the most profitable sectors. Uh, so even before you can figure out how profitable <coughs> financial inclusion is, you're not experiencing that whole space uh, sufficiently. So I think there's a lot of room for a combination of the commercial institutions and the regulators to come up with where there has to be far more uh, in the normal flow incentive uh, to get this done rather than uh, you know, somebody sort of do it as a very special act mm. or a very special institution as Mrs. Sinha has. Uh, but I think we have to just make it uh, very possible in the normal course. Then profitability is not that relevant because there are lots of products and segments we do with are either loss leaders or are not really profitable on their own, but they bring in a relationship and the relationship is profitable. And I think we haven't got to that stage yet. And Chani, if I could also bring into the point, and before I open it up, for, I'd just like to ask you, did you get help from the government in Cambodia? No. It, uh, no. In, in, in terms of regulation, we have them. Subsidies, is, incentives? No, no, no subsidy. It's truly commercial. Huh? Mm -hmm. But we, we do have the government in terms of uh, regulatory development. We sit in the government committee. Because in Cambodia, the government established the GPSF, the Government Private Sector Forum. I'm the co-chair of working group on banking and finance, but we can give comment to the government in terms of uh, what kind of regulation which impact on, on, uh, on the bank and on financial institution. When we see that it, uh, it, uh, it uh, block us for growing, we make recommendation to the National Bank of Cambodia. Yeah. So we don't, we, we, don't, we, we don't have any subsidies from the government. Does anybody want to yeah. say something? Well, I was just going to say that government, governments can lead. I think the, the, the whole point is that the models have to be sustainable in and of themselves, because otherwise you're always going to be, you, you, you're limited by CSR. Right? You have to be able to build a self-sustaining ecosystem. But I do think that governments and a lot of their programs have the ability to kickstart the process, whether it's by saying, I want to be able to electronify the benefits that I want to put together. I want to think about how I can use um, electronic uh, identity or national identity programs and combine that with payment potentially to create use incentives for people to want to come and make themselves available. And then what would happen would be the savings that are made available to the government. Those savings can be realized to build the infrastructure. And I think those models are there. It's just probably a combination of things that happen that, that need to put it together. Because I think the key thing is getting some impetus, getting the use cases there, getting the benchmark that you can look at. And then people then think about the idea. And that's why um, we've had success in South Africa. And that's why we're now moving that to Nigeria. That's why we're looking to have those conversations in Southeast Asia as well, for the, the same reason that there is a role for government regulatory. Um, and in terms of you know, creating an impetus to make things happen. Okay, so when, David, sorry. if I may just pick up on, on one aspect of government and, and where government can play a role, and it's really on the regulatory side. I think as more and more models for lending to the poor or, or, or doing you know, financial transactions with the poor, um, it's very important that the regulators understand that this is not quite conventional banking. And some of the prudential standards, limits, you know, requirements that are required when you lend to a you know, S&P 500 company may not quite apply to a, you know, a sidewalk food vendor. Because you know, in, in the Philippines, for example, and I would have to test the central, you know, Banco Central when I make the application, but if, if one of the requirements to establish a lending uh, relationship is to require a BIR or a tax return, mm -hmm. You know, a sidewalk food vendor may not understand what we're asking for, and, and therefore it defeats the purpose from the very beginning. So I think it's very important for regulators, if they truly want to promote financial inclusion and, and, and microfinance lending and so on, it's, it's really to understand the needs and the profile of the clients, just like the way the bank has to. And, and the regulators have that important role as well, so that they can provide the, the right regulatory framework for a different type of financial uh, activity. I do think, uh, Lita, that those uh, examples do work. I mean, Pakistan, for example, I think has got a, a tiered and proportionate KYC procedure, which means that, okay, my, the proof that I have for this transaction needs to be lower because I'm only sending you uh, 100 rupees. 
right? But if I want to make a much more significant transaction, actually, I'm sorry, but I need to know much more about you and who you're sending the transaction to. So I think the models are there. It's a question of you know, making sure that we're, we're sharing the best practice and, and encouraging the dialogue. And it accommodate, the system accommodates these correct, models. Correct. And perhaps for those who are not aware, uh, Lito is the former finance minister of where we are right now. Okay, now at this point, we have um, a few minutes for some questions. If someone would like to ask, yes, ma'am, please. Um, can you please introduce yourself and maybe I'd also point out who you'd want Hi, to answer Hi, I'm Lizelle. Question. I'm a global shaper from Davao City. It's in Mindanao, the south of the Philippines. Now we're talking about inclusion. We are talking about the unbanked. I want to give first a context. Um, there are a lot of communities and people who are, whose income is not enough. So I appreciate very much earlier, you know, you're talking about the culture of saving, but what's actually happening in my area, in our community, in Mindanao, we have a culture of loan. So if you have a problem, the only thing that can augment it is a loan because your income is not enough. The other, the other culture is, um, I have this idea of if I don't see my money, I am not confident, I'm not secure. So I have to physically see the bills and count it for me to be really, really secure that I have something to spend. So what, what uh, financial transaction is left? It's the sending of the money in and out of the area. Now in the Philippines, we have a chain of pawn shops, lending institutions. And so now these are enabled to send money in and out of the area. So I don't need to go to a bank, I just need to go to a pawn shop, fill up a form, send my physical cash to my kid in the city who's studying. And then there's a question of, again, saving. So if my income is not enough to augment my need, how I have no other income left to save. So this is, this is the context, this is the situation. So now my question is, are we talking to these people? And if we are, what's the message that we are sending? Are they part of the inclusion that, that we are trying to you know, achieve? Is there anyone in particular you'd like to? Um, I would very much be, be very interested to hear the opinion of someone from the Philippines, okay. specifically. <laughs> I guess I would be yes. there. <laughs> or myself, but I can't answer. I'm the moderator, so. <laughs> okay. I think for uh, financial inclusion, I think we need to make a distinction. You know, the, the situation you describe where an individual does not earn enough for his or her basic needs or his family or her family's needs, fi microfinance is not going to help that. Right? That's the job of government, and that's what they do through cash transfers and other subsidies. What financial inclusion can do is enable that person to enhance, upgrade, improve his or her earning, earning capacity so that at some point they will be able to fulfill all the basic needs of the family or the individual. And I think that's the role for you know, people around this, this stage and, and many of you you know, who are involved in you know, microfinance and other related activities. It's how to empower the poor who otherwise may not have that access to financing, to capital, to, to financial transactions that would allow that person to be gainfully employed or doing a business so that he or she can provide for, for the basic needs. It is not about you know, filling the gap of the, you know, the shortfall between earnings and basic requirements. That is not sustainable. That happens with gifts, with grants, with government subsidies, not with you know, microfinance or other related activities. Please, sir. Hi, my name is Aldi. I run a mobile financial services company in Indonesia. My question is to Ms. Sinha and Mr. Chani. So you both managed to scale a very disruptive business model that, was ta that were tailored for the poor, essentially. Uh, throughout the journey of you scaling up, how did the mainstream banks and incumbents react? Did they try to partner with you? Did they try to crush you? Or did they simply let you be? And in hindsight, how do you think they should have reacted? Thank you. Very interesting question. Actually, Mandeshi Bank started with no outside fund, no grants, nothing. It was a mobilization of sh a share capital because it's a cooperative bank, and then mobilization of deposits and lending. When you go through this model, 
which I, I now I think at that time I used to think like, why can't we take a grant and, you know, have a big institution? But now I realize that helped us to create a very good mid business model one and a very solid product diversification. So it's actually uh, uh, when you start such institution, uh, it takes time to scale. And I personally also have uh, sometimes ambiguity about the scale. Like, Having a single product of joint liability group, say group of five, and scale all over the country, you can do it. But the question also is that what is the quality of impact do you have? It's very easy to have a single product and scale all over. But that doesn't mean that the, it's solving the mission or the purpose. What I think is that when you, it, it's a scaling off at both the level, like when you are banking with those people, you want to see a qualitative impact on that, that their income increases. And that's why people also are banking with you because they want to create a wealth. So are we creating it? If we want to do that, then you have to also have a broader, broaden your uh, products. And so you scale not only just vertical, but you scale horizontally, that is one. Second, in spite of saying that, if you want to bring down the cost, you need to scale. And that has to be there whenever you are doing business. And so for that, there are various, I mean, with Mandeshi, what we had to do is that to see that our cost is not increasing, cost of like administration cost, and how do you do that? So majority of our agents who are doing banking, they are on commission basis. So that helps to keep the cost low, but also helps to scale. And while scaling, then what do you see is that how, much, how many people one person is going to serve? So it's very interesting that by, by, with using of technology and everything, our agent first, they, what they see is that, is it possible for us to reach at least 75 people? If not, we are not going to use the technology. And it's very important because these people are, are the forerunners of the bank. So for scaling, you have to provide a very different delivery mechanism as far as banking to unbanked is concerned. Because those people are not going to come to the bank. You have to reach them. And how do you reach? You have to reach in such a way that you have a scale and you also manage the cost. Both the things you have to, and there is an incentive. So, so how did we scale is that our uh, field agent had an incentive because they get a commission for the additional client that is one, with the technology so that you have a proper monitoring system and you also control fraud, that is second. And third, to keep the cost down so that you have a enough margin because I also feel by end of the day, very important thing is that how much profit you are making yearly and how much reserves you are creating for the bank. And these things are also important. So it's a very, I mean, it's a very balancing approach and very tough. Uh, operating, but your delivery mechanism has to be very important for scaling up. And if you, otherwise, like my microfinance institution in India had a lot of problem with the scale. If you are scaling and ending up into a multi-debt uh, or a multi-loan, then also it is a problem. So I think you have to think on all those issues and, and, and scaling and profit is important finally um, with the quality. Chani. So thank, uh, thank you for the question. So in, in, in uh, my case, when we, we start as an NGO, so the fund, uh, to your early on question, that the fund is a grant from the UNDP, 600,000 US dollars. And then the UN uh, advised that, that 600,000 provide loan to 1,400 customer. So, and then the, the interest rate is, uh, it, uh, they call subsidized, then, but in fact, it's not sub subsidized because it's 10% flat. No? We anticipate 10% uh, flat. And you see, uh, when we have a small team, we cannot, uh, we cannot, uh, dis we cannot disburse 600,000 to 1,400. So, and then uh, later on, uh, when we obtain license as a bank, I mean, our staff got trained uh, properly. Uh, we have the system in place. Uh, we have. Uh, the network uh, bill, and then we uh, we can uh, uh, this uh, can provide loan more to uh, uh, customer, uh, not just loan. I mean uh, loan and uh, financial services to to the customer. So again, like uh, if, uh, it, if in terms of uh, scope and scale, no, like uh, the the small size uh, when you you offer, and also the large uh, scale when you provide. So. 
I, I can see that when we were NGO, we, we run on the subsidy based on the donor funding support. But when we became commercial bank, I mean, uh, the professionality of the staff and also the understanding, well understanding of the customer, I think these two combination and with the support of the local authority, we can uh, provide a financial service loan and uh, with, uh, with, uh, without almost uh, non-performing loan, almost zero at this afternoon. I, I listened to the speak of the president of Indonesia. He mentioned that non-performing loan in Indonesia, 4%, 4%. In, in, in Cambodia, okay, in my bank, uh, our non-performing loan is less than 1% for 10 years or this year 11, less than 1%. So if we are 4%, we, 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 get, we get lost. Uh, we we, we uh, uh, lost, no? so less than 1%. So, Again, no, like uh, do do less, and then we, we uh, get lost. And we do more, and then in terms of large scale, I think yeah, yeah a profitability will uh, be uh, from that. I don't know if I respond to the right uh, question, but uh, uh, yeah, and this one. And then second, uh, related to the customers. So when we when we uh, subsidize by the the donor, no, and then when we obtain license as a bank. I think these two different things. From the government perspective, the government see that we contribute uh, to uh, the, their budget in terms of tax are paid. Because when we obtain license, we pay tax. When we were NGO, we didn't pay tax. And then we, uh, we reach a small number of customers, like I said. Uh, even we set the target, but we cannot uh, achieve. But when we pay tax, we set the incentive base for, for per branch, for, per credit officer. No? Uh, and then we can uh, measure the effectiveness of uh, the individual product line so that we can uh, achieve more in the in large scale. Yeah. Okay, maybe just to end, uh, I think, Jasper, you want to say something very quickly? Just very quickly, um, I can speak for India, and I think um, institutions which are either specialized microfinance or special institutions like Mrs. Sinas are actually very welcome uh, to the larger commercial banks because we can use them as an intermediate to get to people we would have never got to otherwise. Uh, so actually, there is really no conflict. And to the Lisa's question earlier, uh, my response is that I understand that there's only transaction possibility and there's no saving and borrowing capacity yet. But even there, if you substitute the pawn shop with a mobile phone transfer, it should be easier, it should be, in theory, cheaper, and it definitely is more secure. Mm -hmm. So I think there's room even in that scenario in Mindalao to sort of bring in a little bit more into inclusion yeah, at a cheaper cost. Yeah, thank you, Jaspal, I guess. I mean, that's all we have time for. We could spend pretty much all night really talking about this topic and really how better to deliver these services. But I think that's one thing that's fairly clear is that the models are there. There are success stories out there. Uh, I think the challenge right now is certainly just bringing that model and trying to adapt it based on, I guess, the needs of different localities uh, the challenge really now is for the government, really, to make uh, itself accommodative for those models to thrive and sustain themselves. Because, I mean, let's not kid ourselves. If there's no profit, it's not going to be there not next month. I mean, perhaps next month, but I guess in the next few years. Now, on that note, I'd like to thank our panelists for all their time. And I'd like to thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you.